You're listening to CKNW's Chief Executives, live from SFU's Beatty School of Business, presented by Fortis BC, energy solutions for every customer. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for doing this. Tell me a little bit about uh, yourself, about growing up. Uh, what, did, what did you think you wanted to do when you were a, a little girl? Um, thank you for having me here today, Bill. And um, to be honest with you, when I was growing up, that was in the days of the TV show Hotel with Connie Selica. And so I thought that I wanted to be a hotel manager and that it sounded very, very glamorous. Um, but uh, as uh, things progressed, my father owned a very strong regional entrepreneurial insurance brokerage that he had founded in Vancouver. And my mother and father had always told my sister and I that we could do anything, be anything that we wanted. And I saw the um, joy that my dad took from his work and how much he liked it. And uh, he had said, listen, if you want, there's an opportunity for you within this business. You have to start at an entry level. Um, you get the foot in the door, but from then you're on your own. And uh, why don't you give it a try? And probably for partly lack of not knowing really what I wanted to do, but mostly because I thought it really would be um, kind of silly of me not to at least give it an opportunity, I uh, decided to follow him into the family business. And how long did you stay? Well, I um, joined him in 1991, um, and he had a head office in Burnaby, but he had a small office in Richmond, and I went to work for him for a year. And I finally decided after about a year, well, probably I decided two months into it, that being the daughter of the president had some pros and cons attached to it, and that uh, it would be worthwhile for me to go and leave uh, the operation and get some experience elsewhere. So we did some investigation, and uh, he dealt with insurance companies across the country. So made the decision to move to Toronto and work for an insurance company called Continental Insurance Company. They had a national career training program, and so they brought um, 16 people just sort of finishing university together from across the country to train them in the insurance business. So I went there, spent uh, a year in that training program, and then worked for the company for another three years. But what was it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what was it about the insurance business that uh, instilled some kind of a passion in you? Well, it's funny because, um, first of all, I think our industry is one of those industries that a lot of people don't think of as a career to go into. Mm -hmm. most, most kids don't grow up and say, I want to go in the insurance business. And, um, <laughs> and the interesting thing is, is that uh, once you're in it, uh, experience is sort of shown with the people that I know working in the industry that you either don't like it or you absolutely love it. And in my case, the moment I went into the business, I loved it. And I think the reason why so many people uh, on our team enjoy the business so much is that there's nothing in the world that doesn't transact without insurance. You can't fly planes, you can't move trucks, you can't do commerce or industry. And on top of it, you get to meet all of these people because every person you meet on the street requires an insurance. So the opportunity to meet a breadth of different people and have exposure to, to diverse industry is just really exciting. And it's something most people I, I don't think would think about. Definitely not. And I think as an industry we actually do a disservice to that. We've um, tried in recent years as an industry to partner more with um, local institutions. There's some great programs out of Alberta. There's one I believe at Ryerson in Ontario. And uh, we've done some work with BCIT, but uh, our industry needs to do a better job of getting out to university campuses and really um, promoting all the great things about our business. Was there a point when you were starting or that you'd, you'd been in the business for a little while where you started to realize that you had real leadership qualities and that you could go somewhere in the, in the industry? I, you know, I, I don't think that I've ever been somebody who's aspired for the next job. So um, I think that what I know I do pretty well is work with other people and be part of a team. And I think that um, I can be a pretty good listener. But I don't think there was a point where I said, I want to be CEO of this company. I just thought, you know, I'm going to work really hard and I want to constantly be learning and challenging myself. And as I did that, opportunity presented itself along the way. 
But what, how would you describe the qualities of, of, of leadership, of somebody who can lead a team? Well, I think uh, one of the biggest things, when I, when I look at successful leaders that I know, I think most of those people, not all, but a lot of them never aspired to have the top job. And uh, what they do is they have a great sense of it's not about them, it's about the employees and team that works with them, the communities that we're involved in, and ultimately our customers. And so I think that leaders um, have those skill sets. I think that good leaders are great communicators. Who are some of those people? Well, um, if you talk about leaders that have had a profound effect on my life, um, I have three people that I'd say from a business perspective have been incredible mentors to me. And, and the first one was my father. Uh, my father uh, is retired. Um, and uh, what he has taught me in life is that uh, you treat all people equally regardless of what their station is in life. He has incredible empathy. Uh, he listens to people very well, incredibly kind. And I think... Um, also taught me the value of work ethic. My, my dad had this saying that uh, if you go to work 30 minutes before everybody else and you just stay 30 minutes later, you'll achieve incredible things in that extra hour that you put in. Um, the, the second leader that I would think had the most profound effect on my business life was my predecessor in my role, a gentleman named Larry Lenniker. And uh, Larry was... Um, I would describe him as fair but firm. So uh, in the case of my father, Herb, probably a bit too much of a softy sometimes. And Larry has a great ability to uh, deliver a tough message in a way that people still want to follow you and get behind you. And Larry also taught me about the importance of surrounding yourself with terrific people on your team. And that um, if you surround yourself with people that are brighter and play to the skill sets that you don't have, you really harness um, great results of that team. And then I think the, the third business person who really has had a um, great impact on me in so many ways, but uh, it's a gentleman named Marty Hughes, and he is our global CEO for Hub International. And Marty absolutely oozes and breathes integrity. And especially when you looked at the economic crisis that happened in 2008, He's a gentleman that uh, says we're heading on a path, whether the path is popular or not, and finds a way to get everybody to rally behind him because the cause is right, because he does what he says he's going to do every single time. I want to find out what you look for in people when you're trying to, to build a team. So we're going to come back and talk much more from the Beatty School of Business with Tina Osen right after this. <laughs> talk a little bit about uh, the kind of people you recruit, uh, the qualities you look for in people that uh, you want to bring into your company? So uh, there's two ways I'd answer that question. First of all, there's what I look for from a leadership perspective. And it's interesting, when, when I joined the company, no, let me rephrase that, when we sold the company in 1999 to Hub, at that time we had um, just under 100 employees. And today we're coming close on 340. And what you learn as the company gets bigger, that you need to find leaders that really know how to lead people well. And uh, that much as I would like to touch all of our people in that very personal, intimate way that I had the ability to do when we were much smaller in scale, it's very hard to do that. So we look for leaders. Um, historically in our past, we'd look for people with technical insurance um, acumen. And we've learned that that is not the way to go. Um, you can train the technical skills, but you can't train that emotional intelligence and that ability to lead people and manage to results and, and create a positive outcome and be fair but firm and all those things I said. So uh, we tried a bit of an experiment uh, two years ago. Uh, we have a chain of retail branch locations. and thought, you know what, instead of looking for the insurance acumen, let's look for people that know how to lead well. So we went to places like Starbucks, McDonald's, Ikea, and uh, got people that really know how to um, lead teams. And they have proven to be great, great additions um, to the organization and bring a really great, fresh perspective. When we're looking just for talent on our team, we're looking for people that are self-starters. I think we have a culture that rewards people that work hard and take the initiative to do things uh, themselves. 
Uh, we want people that are entrepreneurial, uh, that know how to take projects from A to Z, and uh, a given for us is integrity. We, we don't want you on the team if you don't have integrity. And what do you do to keep those people? Well, uh, I think that to keep those people, we have to really invest in them. So besides having good talent and good leadership, <clears throat> we really look at how can we um, develop them in their careers, uh, what is the path that we can set them on? And, and I will say, uh, 10 years ago, we weren't so good at this. Uh, 10 years ago, we rewarded people that worked hard, but we didn't really career path them. And now we're really working hard to set a career path for our people to really provide them with the training and the development and consistently invest in them. We're looking at uh, ways to cross-train so that with our more senior technical people that are nearing retirement, that have this wealth of knowledge shadowing them and partnering them with other people in the organization. So I think really just trying to build a culture where our people feel that we're invested in them, we're invested in their success. How do you do that? Uh, it all comes down to leadership. So when, when, um, when I talked about you know, attracting leadership, People need to feel like they're being recognized, that there's a plan, that when we say we're going to do something, we do it. And, and I don't want to suggest that we've been perfect in every case, but uh, we're trying to get better and better at really trying to live by what we say and, and laying out expectations for somebody in a role. And if they deliver on those expectations, then rewarding them accordingly. Rewarding them how? Um, either in terms of you know, it could be anything, it, rewarding them in terms of a job promotion, if that's the path that we set them on, rewarding them in terms of letting them go to a course, if that's what they so desired. Um, it, it, de it depends. It's unique to every situation. You talk a little bit uh, about the recession, when, when hard times really hit. What did, what did that do to you and your company? And was there a time where you, you really wondered if, if there was a future? Well, first of all, the beautiful thing about insurance is that everybody needs to buy it. So there was no... <laughs> there, there was, can you afford to cover it? <laughs> no. And so um, we never were concerned about our ability to stay afloat in a poor economic environment. But I will tell you that as our clients go, we go. So if our clients were suffering, if their gross revenues were down in their business, if they are reticent to invest in new projects because of lack of confidence in the economy, it impacts us. And, uh, you know, I have the privilege of leading these operations here in Vancouver, but if you look to some of our operations south of the border, they really felt uh, the hit of that economic environment and a lot of clients go bankrupt. Um, so, you know, but, but what we did do, um, and it was tough messaging at the time, we made a commitment to our employees when things got bad, right at sort of the beginning, 2008, 2009. We stepped out to our employee group. We'd never done this in our entire history and said, uh, we are not going to give any wage increases uh, through the course of this year, maybe the next year, until we see what happens in this environment. And the commitment in return is that not a single person on this team is going to lose their job. So tough messaging, uh, not popular, but I think two years later, an appreciative team who saw friends in other industries lose jobs, so we were proud of what we did. You say not popular, but I suspect that the assurance that people weren't going to lose their job, remembering the climate and the fear that was in the air at that time, that probably was very reassuring to, to people. I think so. I hope so. Um, I, we certainly had people say to us after the fact that they really appreciated that we took that position. And, um, you know, we're, we're proud that we took that position. I think it, it was. It gave them peace of mind when they went to sleep at night that there wasn't going to be a problem. And, and there were a lot of industries laying people off. And so now when you look ahead into the next three to five years, and is, is that is that what you tend to do? Do you try to gauge what's going to happen in the next three to five years? Our, our executive management team sits down and, in fact, we're going into strategic planning meetings next week and uh, we try to predict where we think things are going in various industries. And, you know, it's interesting being in the insurance business and, and at Hub dealing with all these customers and because of our size and scope, 
it's actually a great predictor of where we think things are going as well. So, for example, we have a commercial side of the business um, where you know we're insuring hotel chains and manufacturing companies and big real estate schedules and. On, on that side of the business, we're seeing a cautious optimism in the market, most certainly. We're seeing customers investing in uh, new projects, um, building new things, um, acquiring new companies. So it, it certainly gives us a cautious optimism that things are going the right way. On the other side of our business, which is what we call the personal line side, so where you insure your house or your boat or your cars, um, and some of the toys, the things that are some of the luxury items like um, the, on that side of the business, I would say that we are seeing a little bit more cautious approach by the individual consumer. They're not buying as many houses. Car sales are up over last year, but still nowhere near some of the record yeah, but how highs. About yachts? Yeah, yacht, 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 yachts are struggling a little bit. <laughs> That's definitely not uh, one of our largest growth sectors right now. <laughs> we'll come back and talk more with Tina Olson at uh, the SFU Beattie School of Business right after this. Just before the break, we talked about uh, the yacht business not being great, and I was uh, being uh, a little bit facetious, but at the same time serious, because those are the kinds of things, yachts, uh, cottages at Whistler, waterfront recreational property, those are the kinds of things that seem to stall when there's a recession, and I wonder if, uh, if you're in the insurance business, do you look to see when those kinds of sales start to pick up, is it a sign that the economy really is starting to rebound? We think so. Uh, we definitely think so, and, and as I said, we're not seeing it so much in the marine market right now. Um, interestingly, we are seeing a surge in clients purchasing seasonal properties all of a sudden, and it's just been in the last few weeks, so we've seen more and more clients purchasing properties in Whistler or different things, so I'm not sure if it's... Uh, listening to the market and, and the fact that sometimes when Vancouver goes down, Whistler goes up in real estate prices and it's a good time to buy. But Does that really happen? So, so I'm told. I am not a realtor and uh, certainly not an economist, but um, uh, from what I understand, when Whistler uh, prices go up, we tend to see the Vancouver housing market drop. What about climate and uh, how concerned are people in your industry about climate change, extreme weather, uh, more storms more often. Is that a serious concern that you have? It's a very serious concern for us. Um, the number of catastrophic storms that are hitting our industry are on the rise. There was just um, a significant remodeling of the earthquake exposure in British Columbia, specifically something that we all live with. Um, and uh, the likelihood of a major earthquake happening in this area, uh, based on uh, you know seismologists and what the industry is looking at, has increased. And so, what what happens with that is that you have the reinsurance companies that are um, insuring the insurance companies, uh, changing um, their modeling in terms of how much capacity they're prepared to put out for a risk. In other words, if you have a hundred million dollar building, perhaps before they were prepared to insure 75 million of that building and now maybe they only want to take 30 million dollars of that exposure. So, um, and when capacity shrinks, you see pricing go up in that business. So, uh, cli climate change is a concern for uh, the insurance industry in a significant way and um, there's a lot of things happening and a lot of storms occurring that just weren't happening before. And um, trying to wrap our arms around it as an industry is uh, quite a heady project. And I think um, the concern that we might have in BC down the road is, you know, do the insurance companies continue to provide earthquake on these exposures or do we move to some sort of government funded model like other jurisdictions in the world? But we're not there yet, but could head but down you think that that's, path. You think that's coming? I think there's a real possibility that we could see that in the future. If I said to you, what is your biggest challenge for personally and as an industry, what would you say? On a personal note, the biggest challenge is continuing to attract fantastic talent to the organization. Uh, you know, we have a baby boomer population that's re nearing retirement that have a lot of knowledge within their brains that needs to be imparted on a future generation. So trying to attract quality talent um, absolutely is a major issue for us. As an industry, I think 
specifically in Canada, we are definitely concerned with the risk of earthquake, not only in British Columbia, but also the possibility of it occurring in Quebec. Uh, Quebec sits on some fault lines, and I think from the finance minister's portfolio in Canada, I'm pretty confident or have it on some good authority that earthquake is of major concern for him and the potential economic devastation it could do to this region or Quebec. British Columbia and Quebec. Yes. Yeah. In terms of uh, your personal life, how do you uh, how do you strike a balance? Give me give me a run through your day. When are you when are you up? Monday or Saturday. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so um, I'm usually up around six o'clock. Um, normally, um, I would be working out first thing in the morning. Unfortunately, I got sidelined with a bit of a back injury this year, so I'm not working out uh, quite as vigorously as I was before. And um, you know, my day starts from a work perspective around seven o'clock, seven thirty, and um, at the office. At the office or at appointments, um, sometimes, you know, the great thing about um, uh, my job is that I have flexibility and now with technology, of course, you can work anywhere. So if I have appointments downtown, I might work at, from a coffee shop or we have a location downtown or, you know, sometimes, quite frankly, the odd time, I must admit, I hide in my own office at home and do some work there because there's no distractions and I can get a lot of stuff moving off my desk, but mostly at the office. and. You know, the average day for me is probably ten and a half hours. And um, but one thing I will say that's very, very important to me is dinner with my family. I have an You've got two girls. I have two girls and an incredible husband. And um, I'm a big believer that if you have family dinner with your family, that that keeps your kids out of a lot of problems and creates a great family unit. And uh, my husband and I, uh, one of us always eats dinner with our children, but 90% uh, of the time, unless I'm traveling for business or have the odd event here, uh, I come home, we have a family dinner every night. I'm very spoiled, by the way. It, it, it was interesting when you talk about balance. Um, a few years ago, our, our global CEO had asked if I'd do a presentation to um, up and coming leaders in our company about balance and for some reason they seemed to think that I was the most balanced leader so I, <laughs> I I'm not sure why but anyways maybe because I have dinner with my kids but I, I um, gave this whole presentation and talked about all the things I do I'm religious about scheduling all of my activities in my calendar so my exercises there my time with friends you name it everything gets built into my calendar I'm almost at the point where I need to schedule go to bed at 10 o'clock so you have eight hours sleep. But um, I did this whole presentation and I had people coming up to me after, especially the young women in our company saying, thank you so much for making me feel that I can do this and that it's all possible. And then after I walked out of the room and I, like a light bulb going off in my head, thought I am such a hypocrite because what I didn't say is that my husband does 95% of the work at home cooks all the meals, takes care of uh, everything in the house, does almost all of the laundry. So uh, do I think you can do that without having a great partner that's supporting you on it? No, you can't. And so here I had all these women who were working full time, their husbands were working full time, and I totally said a lie effectively. So. We'll come back and have much more with Tina Olson from the SFU Media School of Business right after this. husband's here. I'm waiting for him to say, actually, I do 99.9% .9 of the work. <laughs> we are back at the uh, Beatty School of Business with Tina Olson, uh, CEO of Hub International. Uh, and there are a lot of women in this room wanting to know where you found that husband. <laughs> well, we have been together a long time. We've been together 26 years and this is going to make me sound really bad because I was dating one of his friends, but, <laughs> but um, no, I, uh, I, we just met a long, long time ago and we had some mutual friends and honestly when I met him I knew that he was a good person. I looked for somebody and a partner that was a lot like my dad who was, is an amazing husband, an amazing person. And, and, uh, Does he have a job other than looking after you? Um, my husband is at home full time with our children. 
and uh, raising our family and keeping us all in check. And, and that's a big job. It's a big job. It's a much harder job than I do, to be honest with you. To raise two little people that are good corporate citizens, I think, is the hardest job out there. What do you do when you're not working? Uh, what do you read? Do you travel? Uh, we are avid travelers. In fact, uh, I am somebody who always says I work to travel. I love to travel. I don't love to travel for work, but I love to travel for fun. And um, so we, we travel a lot. I think for me, uh, it's bad, but for me, I have a hard time sort of letting work go when I'm in the same city and in the same place. It's a little hard mentally for me to shut off my brain. So I like to get away and remove myself from sort of my regular environment as much as I can. Um, the last vacation we did, uh, we have good friends that we travel with quite a bit. Uh, our families are very close, but we've started doing uh, biking vacations with our kids. So we did a trip in the Loire Valley where my husband and I biked with our kids anywhere from 30 to 50 kilometers a day, and it was absolutely fantastic. Self-guided trip and the opportunity to spend uh, six grueling hours a day on the road with your kids with uh, warm weather and just the environment where we're talking and chatting was really fantastic. But it, all travel is good for me. I think the only place that I wouldn't go to is somewhere with a very large snake population because I'm <laughs> quite terrified of those. But <laughs> where, where would you like to go that you haven't been? Oh, there's so many places that I'd like to go. I haven't done a trip to Asia, and I would like to go to Asia, but I get lured by uh, the European culture. I always seem to pull myself back to Europe. Um, and the, the other place I want to go is uh, Argentina. It's a bit of a joke in our family. I've always had this uh, dream to learn how to tango. And my <laughs> husband said to me, I have no interest in learning to tango. And I said, well, hmm, are you okay with me doing it? He said, sure. I said, well, okay. Tango with South American dance instructor. My husband doesn't want to go. I can live with it. So, <laughs> good. And can he? I think he'll be fine. <laughs> and what, what about reading? Do you do you read? Uh, yes, I'm an avid reader. Um, I, I love to read. Our, our children love to read. It's funny. Um, my friends bought me a Kindle. I had a hard time giving, giving up the printed book, and they bought me a Kindle. And now I think that's absolutely the best thing ever, especially when I travel for business or I'm on vacation, because I would normally go through seven, eight books on a vacation. Now you have this all on the Kindle. But I do uh, like the printed book. And I, I would say my favorite bookstore in the city is is actually Kids Books on uh, West Broadway, and everybody would say Kids Books, but they have a phenomenal little section of books for adults to lure the parents while the kids are buying books, and every book that I buy there, I just enjoy. They're so knowledgeable. So, What kind of books? You know, I would like to say to you that I read a lot of business books. I do read business books, but I don't read them for um, enjoyment. I read them more for knowledge. Um, I enjoy, um, you know, I just read a book called Where Do You Go, uh, Bernadette. Uh, I read one called The Rosie Project recently. I like books about, um, I'm going to forget on the title, I just wrote a book about a woman who had grown up in Iran over 50 years and through the Shah and Ayatollah and uh, those kind of reads I really enjoy. But real, real life, not... Uh, yes. Like we're talking with uh, Tina Osen, and we're going to come back with uh, what I like to call our Vanity Fair uh, segment, and she has been forewarned and I'm sure is well prepared, and we'll be right back with that. <laughs> we are back at the Beatty School of Business, the SFU Beatty School of Business in downtown Vancouver, talking with Tina Osen, the CEO of Hub International, and I did warn you that I was going to ask you this, so you'd have a little bit of time to think about it. If you could have dinner with four people, any four people, on the planet, alive or dead, who would it be and why? Sure. This was a tough question to think about, but the first one's a little bit obvious, and probably some of your past panels have said this one, and, and the first one would be Martin Luther King. And, and that's simply because the level of courage that he has and had uh, and just that single-handed sort of determination and focus to uh, fight for something that he believed in just 
absolutely amazes me. One of my favorite quotes is um, Eleanor Roosevelt's, do something every day that scares you. Well, I would never do something every day that scared me because I would just be a walking basket of nerves. <laughs> but but um, today I'm doing something that's scaring me. But, um, but I think for him to do something that to me seems so frightening day in, day out. So, so that one's maybe a bit more obvious. The, the other three uh, were in our family big foodies and uh, absolutely love going to restaurants, both uh, high-end dining but also casual, but just great craftsmen. So uh, either Farron um, Adria of El Bulli fame or else Thomas Keller of the French Laundry. And uh, there's an example of two chefs that have absolutely um, been at the top of their game and their craft and constantly innovating how people eat and um, just the level of perfection and the detail in the customer service I think is exceptional and I just love food so it's a good fit. Um, the third would be Mike Krzyzewski of Duke University fan um, fame, uh, the coach for the NCAA uh, basketball team and uh, he's won, I think, more Coach of the Year awards than pretty much any other coach out there, and um, they've won many championships. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, I grew up watching NCAA basketball with my dad. Um, we'd go down to uh, Scottsdale on spring break, and my mom and sister would be doing the smart thing, be at the pool or enjoying the sunshine, and my dad and I would be sitting in some pub or restaurant inside some little dark place watching these basketball games, but I think any coach that can take a new group of talent into a team year after year after year and deliver phenomenal results that I could learn a lot uh, from them. And the third is probably, or the fourth I guess, is I, I do have a passion for fashion and my sister actually has a phenomenal clothing store in Vancouver called Mish and, and she and I both love fashion and um, there's a designer called, called Consuela Castiglione who is the designer for Marnie and Marnie always has very fun and creative and bright prints and graphic and I just love her expression and the color. I like being surrounded by color and um, so I, I think she'd be somebody great to have at the table. Each and every one of those people in some way has displayed great leadership. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I mean they're all at the top of their game in their various industries and, and I think I admire uh, you know, the ability to do it through sport or through food or um, through fashion and, and certainly Martin Luther King doesn't need much explanation but, no. but they're, they're the top of their game. But it's interesting you say that you, you talked about sports because many, many years ago a friend of mine's father was in the insurance business his entire life and he used to ask me about athletes who might be interested in going into the insurance business because he thought that if you could uh, thrive in the athletic world, and you mentioned coaching in the athletic world, that you'd be ideal for the insurance business. I think there's a few reasons for that. First of all, I actually think sports sets you up well for any business. and. Uh, it's interesting, I'm part of an organization in Vancouver called the Young Presidents Organization and they have so many great dynamic leaders in this organization and it's shocking how many of them have been at the top of their game in various sports. So there is definitely a translation from sport to industry and that ability to work in a team and demonstrate leadership skills when you need to demonstrate those leadership skills. So. Um, and then uh, with respect to our business, I think having that network of people that you meet through sport lends itself very well to any sales-based industry. So, Tina Olson, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a real pleasure. I think the people here in the audience have enjoyed it uh, too. And uh, thanks again. Thank you very much, Bill.